Well, grace and peace today. We're going to be in the book of Jonah, so if you have a Bible, would you open it up to the book of Jonah? Now, it's a hard one to find, Jonah. I mean, it's right between Obadiah and Micah. So yes, you, Micah, we named you after that book. Between Obadiah and Micah. If you have your phone, it makes it pretty easy, but if you're like old school and use paper, it's hard to find. little tip that I came across is it's in the section of the Bible in which all the names of the books sound like Star Wars characters. No, I, no, I'm serious. I mean, you think about it. Obadiah and Obi-Wan, right? I mean, it's similar, right? And then, then there's uh, Nahum, and there's Anakin, and Chewbacca, and uh, Micah. They're all in there together. And if you can't find it still, a um, little advice, just get to the table of contents in the beginning of the book. That makes it pretty easy. As you're finding Jonah in the Bible, I'd like to share with you our uh, Lenten uh, missional project. It is a ministry we're going to par- partner with that you're going to be hearing quite a bit in the weeks ahead. It's called Transformational Living Ministries. Um, check out that graphic up there. It is. Yep. And uh, it's a Christian-based recovery home uh, currently for men here in Columbus, and they use a combination of 12-step recovery and accountability, and they're doing a great work. Uh, the goal is to give residents an opportunity to live productive, substance-free lives. Here's a picture of the house. Put that on the screen. Yep, the house. Um, they are focused on helping residents encounter Christ community and others uh, to transition back into society with a solution-based thinking, communication, and coping skills, empowering them to be productive members of society. And then we have a picture of the guys. If we can put a bump, this, this is the residents. Good group of guys. And uh, next week, the director of uh, Trans- Transformational Living Ministries will be here to speak to us about what they're doing. And then during the month of March, there'll be plenty of opportunities for us to participate in this particular ministry. And the good news is, is uh, once this men's house gets established and moving forward, they're going to open up a house for women. And this is good news for our community. Amen? Amen. So you'll be hearing more and more about this ministry in the weeks ahead, and I'm excited. So we're talking about Jonah. Jonah, 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 Jonah. So when you think of Jonah, what do you think of? First thing that comes to mind is the whale, right, right. Uh, Can I just say right off the beginning of this whole Jonah project that the book of Jonah is not about a fish. It's not about a fish. The fish gets two verses out of the 48 verses. I think we can confuse it. And I understand, I mean, there's some great children's books, right? Children's programs and cartoons, and they all feature the fish. And so it's very easy for us uh, to think that the book is about a fish, but it really isn't. So what's the book of Jonah all about? Well, it's about a lot of things. Uh, It's about uh, race and nationalism. Yeah, those topics are big topics today, right? So there is an important element of our study of Jonah that applies to what we're going through in our world today. The book of Jonah is about God's mission, the call to participate in God's mission. And that is relevant, of course, as we just talked about transformational living ministries. We want to be a part of the transformation of our city. We are for Columbus, Indiana in Columbus as it is in heaven, mission is an important part of our church. But then also the book of Jonah is about uh, the struggles that we go through to obey and trust God. And so I know that's relevant for me and I would imagine is for all of us. And, And the book of Jonah is about so much more than that. And ultimately, the book of Jonah is a message for us and for the church. See, Jonah wants a God of his own making, a God who simply smites the bad people, the wicked Ninevites, and blesses the good people, people like Jonah and his country. And when the real God, not the Jonah's counterfeit, keeps showing up, Jonah is thrown into fury and despair. Jonah finds the real God to be an enigma because God with justice. So Jonah asks, how can this God be merciful and forgiving to people who have done such violence and evil? And just wait till you hear some of the things that these evil Ninevites have done. How could God be merciful and just? 
And that's one of the things that Jonah is struggling with. It's the primary thing that Jonah is struggling with. But ultimately, the book of Jonah is about Jesus. The book of Jonah is about Jesus because all of Scripture, as we have learned, points to Jesus. The purpose of the Bible points to Jesus. The purpose of the Bible points to Jesus. When you're reading a book like Obadiah, Micah, Jonah, or any of those weird, strange books, ultimately it's pointing to Jesus. And so we, uh, here at Sandy Hook during the Lenten season, are not just going to be learning about Jonah. We're going to be learning how the book of Jonah points to Jesus and how we, as followers of Jesus, can understand Jesus more by understanding what Jonah went through. And sometimes we're going to see that Jesus and Jonah are similar, but a lot of times we're going to see where Jonah just goes the complete opposite direction of Jesus. And so the purpose of the Bible is to point to Jesus. So as we study Jonah, we're going to be pointing to Jesus. And so the gospel passage this week, so let's start with Jesus, the gospel passage in our intersections this week, as well as every first Sunday of Lent, is the story of Jesus going into the wilderness. And I believe that taking a look at this story and comparing it to the first few verses of Jonah, we see a contrast between Jesus and Jonah that helps us. So Mark chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, and you maybe have read this uh, this week in your intersections. The Bible says, At once the Spirit sent him, which is about Jesus, out into the wilderness. Notice who sent Jesus to the wilderness. It wasn't Satan. It was the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God sent Jesus into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. So I'd just like us to recognize that Jesus intentionally went into the wilderness. He was sent into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Now, the wilderness is not a place I want to spend a lot of time. You with me? I mean, I really don't want to live out in the wilderness. Now, the Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness, right, on their way to the promised land. And as they were in the wilderness, they were so frustrated, some of them decided they want to go back to Egypt. It was better to be a slave in Egypt and at least have some food than to live in the wilderness uh, dependent upon uh, God for sustenance. And so Jesus went into the wilderness to be a faithful example of who God's people are to be uh, as Israel did not. Uh, they were not faithful. Jesus was Israel. He was a representative of God's people. And so he endured the 40 days in the wilderness and the temptations and the trials and tribulations and fasting and all that stuff because he knew that we needed to go to the promised land. So Jesus led the example. And we, during Lent, follow Jesus into the wilderness Because we know that through the wilderness experience, God changes us, that God sends us into the promised land, that the wilderness ultimately is a place of transformation. And in the Old Testament, they believed that the wilderness and the desert would be transformed into the Garden of Eden. That the wilderness and the desert wouldn't remain just wilderness and desert. That the wilderness itself would be remade and renewed into a future Garden of Eden. And so today, God sends us into the wilderness. And we, follow in the footsteps of Jesus, having faith that God is going to take this wilderness, and maybe the wilderness for you is this season of fasting. Maybe this wilderness is a ministry that God is calling you to in your workplace or in your school or even in your home. God is going to transform The wilderness that you are in, the wilderness that we are in as a church, he's going to transform it into paradise or garden. So we have to have faith in that. And so what I'd like you to see is that Jesus is going into the wilderness intentionally. And so as we take a look at Jonah, we have to see where does Jonah go when God calls him? Does he go into the wilderness or does Jonah go somewhere else? The big idea for today, and this is so super important, is that evil is defeated not by force, but by enduring love. Evil is defeated not by force, but by enduring love. In other words, love changes things. Love transforms things. 
And the lie that you and I are sold, and it's been sold in every culture throughout the history of time, is that violence is the way you defeat evil. In other words, to defeat evil, you have to fight the way that evil fights, with violence. And Jesus would say to us today, Jesus would be saying to Jonah then, is that evil is defeated not by force, but by enduring love. Now, let's get Jonah. If you put, um, Nato, if you put the first few verses on the screen, I just kind of walk through a few of these things. The verse is, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. So if you have your Bible open, you can see that if you would turn to the next page to the book of Micah, notice that the book of Micah starts with, the word of the Lord came to Micah. And so what we see in these books, in this section of the Bible, they all start the same. They are prophetic books. They are books called the books of the prophets. There are 12 minor prophets 12 books in a row in your Bible that all kind of have this same idea, is that God, the word of the Lord, is calling a prophet to do prophetic work. Now, what, is a, what does a prophet do? Well, we often think of prophecy as someone who predicts the future. But that's not what the job of a prophet is. The job of the prophet is to speak the truth to power. To speak truth to power. Sometimes that power is the king. The king of Israel, sometimes that power are God's people, sometimes it's a king of another nation, but they speak truth to power and oftentimes it gets them killed, right? So it's not a fun job to be a prophet in general. It's to speak truth to power, to speak truth. For me to stand up here and if I would be like stepping on your toes or getting on my soapbox and all that kind of stuff, that's a prophetic type work. It's speaking truth, right? And nobody likes to hear truth, even if it's coded in love, if it challenges your assumptions, it challenges your worldviews, and challenges your way of life. But the role of the prophet is to speak truth to power. And so when you see the very beginning, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, it's we put this in the category of prophetic books. But this book, the book of Jonah is different than Micah. The book of Jonah is different than all the other prophetic books because the book of, of Jonah is not Jonah sharing all of his truth with the kings or his oracles, his prophecy. It's not that. This particular book is about sharing the story of the prophet himself. And so it makes it different. And so one of the questions that we have as we study Jonah is like, what is this book? Is it historical? I mean, is it Facts, like one fact after another after another of this guy's life. We really don't know who wrote it. It doesn't seem like the kind of book that Jonah would write about himself. I mean, would you write the kind of book of, hey, this one day I went and bailed on God and went to Tarshish. Or in the end, I'm sitting under a, a plant wanting to die. I mean, that's not the kind of stuff that's flattering about yourself. But anyway, it seems to be historical in some way because it lists, like, uh, Jonah, son of Amittai, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. At least it seems historical, but for a lot of scholars, it seems almost like a parable. Because the expressions in Jonah are all, like, um, uh, not fabrications, but exaggerations. Like, the word great in the book of Jonah is in there a million times. I see, I just exaggerated, because that's part of Jonah. It's like great and greater and greatest. It's this, these words of expression all the way through the book. And so it seems to be like it could be some sort of a historical parable. Like Jesus, he took that, uh, that beggar named Lazarus, and he took the, a real person's story. And so whether it's historical, in fact, one fact after another, or it's historical parable, there's scholars that say either one, and I'm not going to say either one is, is, is the one. But what I am going to say, what both scholars say, man, it is a really beautiful book. And it has so much truth relevant to us today. Jonah is one of the greatest books that is relevant to the lives of believers today. The word of the Lord. The Bible comes to us all the time, doesn't it? Today, the word of the Lord is coming to you. The Bible comes to us every time we open it. 
And so when the word of the Lord comes to us, it begs us to respond. And so the word of the Lord came to Jonah, like the word of the Lord came to Micah, and the word of the Lord comes to us. And the question is, how will we respond? So the next phrase is, or the next few words, says the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Now that word Jonah means dove. So the word Jonah in Hebrew means dove. And the, the dove is a symbol throughout Scripture. We have a dove that left the ark. Uh, Noah sent a dove, and the dove came back with an olive branch to say that there was dry land. So a dove is a part of life. A dove is representative of life. But oftentimes in the Old Testament, a dove is a symbol for Israel. It's a symbol for Israel. It represents Israel. Israel's like a dove. And so we see Jonah as being a dove is a person, but he's also representative of all of Israel. And so when you look at Jonah and Jonah's story, it's not just Jonah, it's really all of God's people. All of God's people struggle with responding to the word of the Lord. All of God's people struggle with disobedience. They struggle with the call of God to speak love and repentance to people who don't deserve it. But also I would say that uh, the idea of um, Jonah being representative of God's people also represents the church. Because I believe just like Israel struggled with responding to the call and mission, I believe at times the church does too. When God calls us to do difficult things, we're very much tempted to do a Jonah, aren't we? We're very tempted to go the opposite direction. And so the uh, Jonah, his family, he is the son of Amittai, it says in Scripture. And Amittai means truthfulness or faithfulness. And so uh, Jonah is the dove, the son of faithfulness, or the son of truthfulness. And it's like somewhat comical, really, when you think about what Jonah does in his story, is he's like the least truthful person. He's the least faithful person. And I do believe that the authors of Scripture have a tremendous sense of humor. And I think when you read Jonah, you sense that. But Am, son of Amittai, is actually mentioned somewhere else in the Bible. It's mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25 where in the, it gives the uh, historical um, uh, the dates and the things that Jonah was a prophet to a guy, a king named Jeroboam II. Jeroboam I was evil. Jeroboam II was evil. And so Jonah, unlike um, Amos and Hosea, Amos and Hosea were very critical of the king because of the king's unfaithfulness and the king's lust for violence and injustice. And he was very much a military person that believed in uh, violence as the way to destroy evil. And so Amos and Hosea criticized the king, but Jonah actually liked the king. Jonah was supportive of the king. And so it's so comical that God comes to the guy who's supporter of violence to go to speak Love and repentance to people who love violence. So it's almost like God knows Jonah's struggles and God is forcing Jonah to confront the stuff that he has going on side. He would be the last prophet I would send to go to Nineveh. But God knows so much better than me. So who's Ninevites? It says, it says that he is called to go to Nineveh to speak or to the great city of Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Assyria is a superpower. And preach against it because of their wickedness has come up before me. So God, is, it's time to deal with the wickedness of Nineveh. Now check out their violence. I mean, this is the most violent nation probably in history, what they did. I mean, talking about torture and things. They would skin, if they conquered a nation, they would skin the people alive leave them living, all right, and then they would bury them in the sand up to their head. Can you imagine the torture of that? They would take their tongue, 
out and they would nail it to the ground and they would just leave them there and let them die by torture. At night, they would just let them listen to Nickelback on and on and on and on. I I actually just made that up. But, I mean, that would be the worst torture ever to listen to Nickelback all the time. Um, But anyway, I mean, the torture. And and, and some of the things they do, this is how bad it would. They would cut off both feet. They would cut off one hand. And they would go up and shake the remaining hand on the person just to ridicule them. They were so violent. They would behead people and stick the, the heads on poles and make family members carry around the, I mean, these are some evil people. And these people, God loves. And this was something that Jonah couldn't handle. Jonah could not handle the thought of God forgiving these evil people. Can you? I mean, think about it. These are like evil, 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 mean, violent, torturous, evil people, right? If God called you to go to them, to speak truth and repentance, with the possibility of God to forgive them, could you go? Could you do it? And so Jonah couldn't do it. Jonah couldn't do it. And, and so what he does, Jonah gets on a boat to go the complete opposite direction of where God was sending him, 1,500 miles. I mean, we're not talking like to the next town or anything. We're talking like complete other side of the world. And that's where they believed Tarshish was. They believed Tarshish was the last stop before the end of the world. They believed flat, right? Flat earth. Any flat earth people? No, I'm just kidding. Flat earth, right? And so they believed that Tarshish, it was in Spain, right? So Tarshish was Spain. And they believed that Tarshish was a paradise-like city, like Hawaii, like you go there and sit on the beach. And and so Jonah was confronted, do I go to the evil people or do I go to paradise? Evil people, paradise. I mean, it's very tempting to think, hey, right now in this winter, in the midst of COVID, I would rather go to paradise, right? Right? very tempted to say that's where I would want to go to. But what we end up seeing is that God desires to use Jonah to be part of the transformation of Nineveh to become paradise. And so what we end up doing is we like the easy way, paradise all ready for us, but the thought of being a part of transforming a group of people or a place like a city like Columbus, Indiana, to be part of paradise or the Garden of Eden, that's too much work. That sounds impossible. And so Jonah ends up going to Tarshish. He ends up buying a ticket to go on a boat to Tarshish. Now, one of the things I am fascinated about, we go to verse 3, if we could, Natalie. Uh, But Jonah ran away from the Lord. He headed towards Tarshish. And he went down to Joppa, which was a port city, uh, where he found a ship bound for that port. There was a ship ready to go. He found a ship ready to go. And I like this, I, I was fascinated by that thought. There's always a ship ready to go to take you in the opposite direction of where God wants you to be, right? There's always a ship ready to go. And it's very easy because you find a ship ready to go to justify it that you're meant to go on that ship, Right? So if you find a ship ready to go, you must be meant for you to go on that ship. I've heard so many people throughout my ministry that would come to me and say, I'm in a horrible marriage. And then I met somebody, and they like me for who I am, and God wants me to be happy, so I'm going to go with them. I mean, I could care the countless number of people that have come to me with that line of thinking. If you want, there's all to go to take you in the opposite direction. And it's very easy to say that's what God wants me to do. And so what we have to be careful of is just because something is easy and something is shiny and something is right there in front of your face, that doesn't mean it's of God, right? And so we have to be very careful because it's very easy to jump on that ship because it's ready to go. And so Jonah jumps on that ship, and we'll get into what happens on that ship. But the point I want to say today is go in the opposite direction of where God is sending them to. So Jesus, 
goes into the wilderness, sent by the Holy Spirit. Jonah goes the opposite direction of the wilderness, the opposite direction of Nineveh that goes towards paradise. So you have two directions. God's calling us today to pick. And so we are a lot like Jonah. We have a choice. Anytime the word of God is open, we are given a choice. Which way do you go today? Do you go to the wilderness, to Lent, to temptation, the testing and trials, fasting, and understanding that through that whole journey, Jesus will transform that wilderness experience into the Garden of Eden? Or will you go to Tarshish because it appears bright and sunny and paradise-like and it's easy and there's a boat ready for you? So there's a choice given to us. And that's a choice that all of us have to make today, is which way will we go? Because ultimately, the lie that God wants us to overcome, disbelieve, is the fact that uh, violence will defeat evil. It won't. The only way that evil can be defeated is love. And Jonah bought into the lie, and so therefore he bailed on what God wanted him to do because he didn't believe that transformation was possible. And so we take a look at this city, right? I, I really, we really like living in Columbus, Indiana. We think it's a nice city. And that's nothing against any other city that we've ever lived in, but we really like Columbus, Indiana. But there's issues in Columbus, right? There's struggles in our city. The question is, will we do the hard work that God is calling us to do to transform it? Or will we kind of hide out where we're at in our comfort and then not participate in what God wants us to do? You know, rebellion is saying no to God. And for Jonah, saying no to God was just as evil as the evil that the Ninevites were participating. And you have asked Jonah, Jonah wouldn't say agreed to that. And for many of us, we wouldn't agree with that. If, if murder is evil, then why is disobeying God just as evil? That's because we have different levels of sin, right? We, we, we have certain things that are declared evil in our culture and things, less things, evil. I was talking to somebody after first service, and we were talking about that, the levels of sin. And I was like, you know what, gossip for God is like assassinating someone's character, killing someone. But we look at gossip so much less than actually killing someone. And understandably so. I mean, I, I, I get that. But understanding that God views disobedience as evil helps us understand the lengths that God went to to redeem Jonah and the lengths that God went to to redeem Nineveh. And the lengths that God goes to to redeem you. See, God sent his son Jesus to endure sin, death, hell, shame, all of that. All of that was, he absorbed all of it when he was on the cross. Every sin and act of disobedience that any of us have ever done has been piled on Jesus. And he endured it. He endured all of it. And when he died, all of that died. And when he was resurrected, he came out to give us freedom from all of that. And so that torture that he went through was done so that you and I can live the lives that he created us to live. And part of that new life that God has called us to is participating in his kingdom work here in Columbus as it is in heaven. And so when we say no to that, when we say no to the call to participate, we are participating in the destruction of the Garden of Eden, right where we're at. And none of us wants to do that. But the, way, the question is, are we building the kingdom of God in the Garden of Eden, the renewed Eden? Or are we stepping away from it and committing the evil that's destroying it? So that choice to rebel or participate is at the heart of what happens every time the word of God is open. So what do we do? Jesus said that Jonah was a lot like him in the way that Jonah shared the truth to Nineveh. 
Now, Jonah didn't have the right motives, but God used that work to change a city. So for us, we have to recognize that even though we are broken, God can still use us to do great works. So if you're here today and you're like, you know what, I just don't have anything to offer. God used a broken man who wasn't all in to change a city. God can use you today. So today we have a choice between life and death, between goodness and shalom and evil. It's a choice that all of us are given, and then we're given that choice every single day. So what next step is God asking you to take today? And will you say yes, or will you go the opposite direction? I think oftentimes we think we got it all together, but there's always 1% of us that's on a boat to Tarshish. We give God a lot. We give him every area of our lives, but there's always one spot. There's always 1%. There's always one area of our life in which we're on a boat to Tarshish. What's that boat for you? What's that boat for you? Is it your finances? Is it a relationship? Is it your thought life? What is it that you're on a boat to Tarshish? And how could all of us get into the uh, wilderness with Jesus and have faith that he can transform it by his love. Would you pray with me? Father, we are grateful for the opportunity that you give us today to respond to your word. Grace and mercy is something that's so counter the way the world works. It's very easy for us to just buy the lie that if somebody back, somebody's evil, we need to commit evil back to them. It's really difficult for us to believe that love changes things hard to see that the love that changes us could transform a city of evil people, a country of torturous people. But yet, if anything from this book of Jonah, we are reminded on how much you can accomplish with your enduring love. And may we today respond to that love by participating in that enduring love as you call us to be part of the transformation of our city and our homes and our workplaces as you, we are part of the transformation and the healing of this world. Help us to be people that believe that enduring love is actually what defeats. Help us to participate today. And so as we take our next step, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide our steps, that we would be faithful, we would be obedient to the call the word of God today. We love you and we thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name.